Good morning, Life Church. How's everybody doing today? It's good, good. It's good to see everybody. Um, this morning, I just wanted to read from Colossians. Um, I know with this week being election week, there's a lot of anxiety, um, maybe some frustrations and worries. Um, and I just wanted to remind us that our kingdom is not here. Um, so Colossians 1 verses 13 and 14 say, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased us our freedom and forgave our sins. So join me in prayer. Dear Father, thank you so much for this time as a body. Um, Lord, as we go into a big day for our nation on Tuesday, I ask that you would first remind us that our kingdom is in heaven um, and not here. Lord, I ask that we would be salt and light in this nation and that regardless of result, um, we would be an encouragement and our hope would be in you, that we would be anchored in your kingship and your authority, um, Lord, and that we would just give all of our anxieties and worries, our hopes and fears to you and remember that uh, your son has given us over to a kingdom of light. Um, Father, thank you so much for this time. Uh, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to sing before Pastor Nolan comes to bring the word. And this song is just a prayer that the Lord would use us, that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus, um, and that he would use us according to his will and purpose for his glory and honor. Um, and so as I sing, take this time to prayerfully consider the words of this song um, and prepare our hearts for the word this morning. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the end of thy love take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee take my voice and let me sing always only for my King Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as my heart it is thine own it shall be thy royal throne take my love my lord i pour at your feet its treasure store take myself and i will be ever only all for thee
shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at your feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Let me pray for us, Father. Let that be our prayer, Lord, that you would just take us and use us however you see fit, however it may be for your glory and honor. We pray now that as Pastor Nolan comes that you would just speak through him this morning straight to our hearts. Give him the words to speak from the truth of your holy word, Father, and your scripture and the message that you have for us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's give God some praise for a new day. Hallelujah. Yes, we thank God for it. It is a blessing to see you. Welcome to those that are watching online. Uh, I just think about some of our very, very faithful saints who cannot be here. I think about Miss Elaine Johnson, who encourages me every week. She texts me and just says, hey, pastor, keep on keeping on. I think about Clay and Elaine Meehan, who are constantly watching since COVID and just pressing in. Wayne and Patsy Arnold, who have been faithful to encourage me. I thank God for them, and I'm thankful to see your faces. I hope y'all had a good time yesterday, maybe getting some candy. I, I kind of like Halloween. For one, it's kind of confusing for me because I didn't grow up doing Halloween, okay? Uh, so sometimes when I'm with my kids, I'm like, am I doing something wrong, you know? But, but it's kind of cool because we get to walk our neighborhood, and it's the one time I get to see what's in my neighbor's house, <laughs> right? Because we go trick-or-treat, and I'm all up in the door, like, how many flags? <laughs> Is that your grandma in a hospital bed over there? No. Um, but, but it's my one time to be nosy. But uh, we got a ton of candy. My kids were jacked up, and then they did crash, so that was great. But it's going to be interesting today because that's what they're going to want to have for lunch. Um, yeah, so just real quick, too. Um, man, I'm excited to see baby Tia Brave in the house. Brand-new parents. Yes. Congratulations. Man, love you guys. Um, I hope you've been overwhelmed by love and a ton of food and all that good stuff. And it's great to see baby Mike in the house, too, um, growing strong. Man, what a blessing it is. I, I love it. Um, so one thing you guys might know, might not know, we do Bible study on Wednesday nights. Uh, we've been doing it through an online streaming platform, and, uh, and I've been doing it. Pastor Stephen did it last week. And I just encourage you guys, tune into that every, six, uh, every Wednesday night at 630 We've been kind of walking through Acts together, what it looks like to live your life, uh, your faith in public, in the public square. So please tune into that. Check it out. Uh, it will be very encouraging for you for some midweek nourishment. So grab your Bibles. Um, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're still working through this by God's grace. We'll cover verses 16 through 19. And the title is, What Being Made New Means for You. Uh, let me pray while you're finding that. God, you are so gracious to us. I pray this morning that you would sanctify us by your word. Father, that you would lead and guide and navigate us through these moments. Father, I don't know what people's weeks have been like. I don't know what they have ahead of them. But God, in this moment, may we just like just rest in you. Just declutter our hearts and minds. Just soak up the word. God, may we just eat from what gives us eternal nourishment and provides eternal truth. So God, be honored this morning. Speak through me, your servant. God, make the word plain, clear, and encouraging and challenging. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm going to read the verses that we have ahead of us so you can know what we're feasting on this morning. Starting in verse 16, Paul writes this. He says, From now on, Therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. There's a lot of rich, deep theological truth in this, and so we're going to break this apart together. So what we see is there's this affirmation by Paul that there is a day that is fixed whenever all of humanity is going to stand before the bar of God's judgment. And on that day when judgment is executed, understand that it will be absolutely fair and it will be absolutely final. Paul, he's making it clear that none of us are escaping this course called life that we're in. And at the end of this life, there is going to be a test. This test will not be multiple choice with many different answers. This test will not be fill in the blank with anything you see fit. It will simply be pass, fail. And you can have the assurance this morning today that you know the answer already in his name is Jesus. He is the answer. But Paul said back in verse 11, he said this. He said, we seek to persuade people about the reality of all that God has done for them in Christ. He says, I want to persuade you because I have this truth that has stood the test of time. I have this truth that is an eternal truth. And I want to persuade brothers and sisters out there who don't know Jesus because this is the answer. There's work to be done. And the reason that he would make much of reconciliation, and that's the word that we, we use several times, and we're going to define that here in just a second, but it's, it's pretty obvious why he would make much of the word reconciliation and say that several times in the text, because there's no need for reconciliation unless there's alienation. Because there's reconciliation, there's alienation, there needs to be reconciliation. And the way that the Bible, it explains our lot as human beings by nature, is that the alienations that we can experience sometime in this life being social or material or personal or psychological, all of those alienations are simply a fruit of the greatest alienation that exists, which confronts us, namely, the alienation that exists if we are born, as we are born in sin, because of our sin, we are then separate from God. But... There is a familiar song that we sing often, and that song is titled In Christ Alone. And that verse really sums up how reconciliation works, how it is accomplished. There's a verse in the song that says, on the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. It's a very simplistic way of explaining how reconciliation works. Now, we are alienated from God on two accounts. For one, we're alienated from him on his side based on the fact that he has a settled reaction towards sin. It has always been established that way since the, the fall of man. He has a settled reaction towards sin. There is a judgment towards sin. But we're also alienated from God on our side because we're, for one, born in sin. And the side effect of that sin nature is that we would rather run from God than bow before God. That is within our, our nature. And if we can tie chapters 3, 4, and 5 of 2 Corinthians together, Paul, what he does is he identifies the marks or characteristics of people who are alienated from God. He says, these are, these are the characteristics you're going to find in folks who are alienated. For one, they boast about themselves. He talked about that in chapter 3. He said that they, they constantly commend themselves. It's all about uh, their clout. It's all about who, uh, in the day it was, you know, who's recommending you, who's commending you, who's supporting you, what are your letters of importance? Who's backing you? That's what it was about. And he also says a characteristic of those who are alienated is that they simply want to boast about outward appearance and not about what's in the heart. So this goes back to the very nature, too, of sin and how he first tempted Adam and Eve. He was pressing the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. He's got no new tricks. He just tries to take a new approach. Also... Another mark of those who are alienated from Christ is those that would seek to live for themselves. He says this in verse 15. The Bible says, And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. 
Please understand that by nature, we live for ourselves. That is the nature of humanity, is to be self-centered, to be inwardly focused. If you have children, you know this to be true, right? There are occasions where they might do something very sweet. They might crawl up in your lap, or they might rub your head or, or give you a hug. But with my sons, it's quickly followed up by, hey, Dad, give me some more juice, it's, it's the nature. They want what they want. We have a generation that has proudly coined the phrase selfie. All about self. We're going to take selfie. It's in our human nature to do so. Now, the alienated, they live for themselves and regard Christ and his people according to verse 16. Now we're in the text together. From an earthly perspective. Let's read it together. Verse 16 says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. So why would Paul first say we regard no one to the flesh? Because he's talking about God's people first. He says we no longer regard each other to the flesh. Why would he say that? Well, it was answered in verse 12. Because we do not glory in appearance, but we glory in the heart. It's no longer just about the exterior for us who are in Christ. We're not just looking at you and creating a judgment based off of what we see. But now it's about what is inside of you. What connects us is what is internal. If you are in Christ. This verse here, practically, it actually it, it helped me uh, just develop this reverence to uh, for, for people in general, especially folks who've been on this earth a whole lot longer than I have. When the Bible says that we're not just regarding you based on the flesh, but based on what's inwardly. Uh, this respect for, for elderly, for senior saints. I, I, I love it when I see the older man that's kind of putting around with the Vietnam veteran hat on. There's just some deep element of reverence and respect that I have for that man because I'm not just looking at him barely skirting along because at one point in his life, he was kicking tail. At one point in his life, he was a bad man. And I look at him and don't just judge him based on what I see externally, but there's something inside there that we should respect and should reverence in a sense. So it, it, it's, it's the nature of us, right? We, we like to look at folks and just create these full-fledged synopsis of people just two seconds after seeing their outward appearance. But Paul says, listen, that's the proclivity that we have, but it's, it's not anything new necessarily because it was actually what was done to Jesus as well. People would look at him and regard him according to his flesh. So what would happen is Paul probably heard uh, well, he did. We know that he heard of, of Jesus and his ministry, and, 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 and we know that Paul, earlier in his life, right, he was one who was uh, against this rebel rouser, this, this sect called Christianity that was rising up. And his responsibility, and he felt a zeal for it, was to douse this thing out, to kill these people who are, who are promoting false religion. And so surely he would have heard of Jesus, but when Paul says that they regarded Jesus according to the flesh, well, probably what happened was, let's say the name of Jesus got brought up, and what people would say, oh, well, that's, that's Jesus? Well, that's just Mary and Joseph's son. We're just going to appeal to him, not in his divinity, but in his flesh. He's just a son. He's just Mary and Joseph's son. People would say, oh, that's just a smart young man, because at 12, he's reciting the Torah word for word in the temple. And they would say, well, he's just very bright. He's just very intelligent, simply appealing to his flesh. And say, well, you know, we were in the countryside and Jesus fed over 5,000 of us and, and, and he gave us a good meal and our bellies were, were full and they're appealing to the, the flesh. They might even say, listen, if your sight is going out or you need a limb corrected or maybe even your loved one died, go to Jesus. They would actually appeal to him as a magician. But... People would encounter Jesus. They would even experience Jesus. And then they would even say, now we know Jesus. But there is a major difference between knowing what Jesus can do and pursuing him for who he is. There's a major difference. 
the transformation that must take place in you, it cannot be performed by simply knowing Jesus in the flesh. You must know him by the Spirit. Simply ascribing to Jesus just based off of the fact that you want him to do something for you. Because the truth is, if you only know him by the flesh, everything that you pursue as it pertains to Jesus is going to appeal to your flesh. That's when we get to, well, you know, I want Jesus because I really need some more money. Jesus, I need a new house. I need a new car. I need a husband. I need a wife. I need good grades. I need a healing. I need this. I need that. I need. But understand, when you know him by the spirit, what you're going to say is more than anything you can do, Jesus. I just want you. I'm going to say amen myself. Okay. when you know him by the spirit, you pursue him for him. You're not just trying to get after what he can do for you or what he can get for you. You want him because you want him. That's what happens when you know him by the spirit. And that's why Paul says the word therefore. Anytime you see therefore, you need to know what it's there for. In verse 17, he then says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Knowing Jesus by the Spirit, that is what places you in Christ. And when you are in Christ, you are a new creation. That is the difference. Being in Christ causes you and I to be a new creation. See, there are those who know Jesus, but they simply know him by the flesh. They would fully embrace what we know to be a false sense of security because what they've done is they've made Jesus palatable for them to receive. And you say, well, how, how do you know that to be true? How is that the case? Well, those individuals, if you pry a little bit, they would say, well, Jesus, he's a good teacher. Jesus, he's a good prophet. There are good parables and good morals and values within scripture to help me live my life. Jesus is even one of many avenues for me to get to heaven. And the thing is, when you ask them if they're a Christian, they're going to say yes without hesitation. But if you pry a little bit deeper, if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll actually find that their theology about Jesus, it is rooted more in what Jesus can do for them. Right? They, they, they need a Jesus that's going to meet their emotional needs. They need a Jesus that's going to meet their, their, their spiritual needs. But I want a Jesus that doesn't require anything of me in return. I just want one that can serve me. But please don't ask me to surrender or give up anything. I, I just need you to come kind of as my life coach to help me through some difficult decisions kind of here and there. But that's really kind of all I need. And what you find is that it's more of this co-parenting type thing between Satan and Jesus. And it's like Jesus is the parent that comes and picks them up on the weekend and does really fun stuff with them. And they have a good time. But when they're done with Jesus, then they go, hey, drop me off at my other daddy's house. Jesus, for them, will be more about helping them do better or be better. But we know that the Jesus of the Bible, he didn't come to help you do better. He came to make you brand new. He came to make you brand new. He didn't come simply to build on a cracked foundation. He came with the dynamite to blow that foundation up and put a whole new one down. Jesus did not come to simply make weak men and women stronger. He came to make dead people alive. That is why Christ came. You think about the nature of being in Christ. That's why the scriptures say if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You're brand new. You're not just made better. You're made new. Brand new. And the old has passed and the new has come. See, because I've been made new, because the old has passed, because the new has come, now I don't just give in to the things that I used to give in to. Why? Because I've been made new. I don't just let my temper rule and control me now. Why? Because I've been made new. I don't treat my spouse harshly. Why? Because I've been made new. 
I love all of God's people, regardless of what they look like, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their nationality. Why? Because I've been made new. I pursue the things of God. I pursue life with the people of God. I used to make excuses, every excuse to not be here. Now I'm trying trying to find reasons to be here. Why? Because I've been made new. We've been made new together. And verse 18 says that all of this is from God. It is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So let's define this big theological term reconciliation, right? And it's really not even a theological term, but when we see it in scripture, it's from this Greek word elasso, and that word means to exchange. To exchange, this word reconciliation. So reconciliation would assume that there's been a breakdown in the relationship. But now, because of Christ, there's been an exchange from a state of enmity and fragmentation to one of harmony and fellowship. Things have been brought back together. In Romans 5, 6 through 11, Paul, he talks about how before this reconciliation happened, There was a severing in the relationship. Paul said that we were powerless, that we were ungodly, that we were sinners, that we were actually enemies against God. We were under his wrath. But God, he initiated this ministry of reconciliation through Jesus. And the incredible part about it is he was completely innocent. We were the one who created the strain in the relationship. The the, the relationship is, is estranged because of us, because of you and I. But the Bible says that he reconciled us to himself. The Bible does not say that we reconciled ourselves to him, but he did it. He initiated it. And the truth that I struggle with in that is that that kicks against everything in my flesh. The fact that God did it, he initiated it, that I couldn't do anything to create it, that he did, that kicks against my flesh. Because when I I think about my life and my nature, like if I make a mess, then I feel like it's my responsibility to clean it up. That's just how I feel. Even when we we go to restaurants and we eat, my wife's the same way as me. Like when we're eating, we're constantly trying to clean up the table and clean up the mess. When the server comes, we like to have the plates stacked up, cleared up, cups together when when my boys are there and and they knock a cup over which happens all the time right she and I are grabbing towels and doing everything except going in the kitchen and grabbing the mop (laughs) we're trying to clean it up and the server has to stop us and say I have it I got it I'm going to clean it up but it's the nature of of how we are we want to clean up our mess But the server takes on the responsibility of cleaning up that mess because they also take on the responsibility and ownership of the table. We understand that God, he did not reconcile us to himself by simply neglecting his righteousness either. God did not simply say, I'm just going to give in to rebellious humanity because y'all continue to do these things over and over. So I'm just going to give in. I'm just going to say, hey, let's just loosen the rules. No, God doesn't loosen his, his rules by any means, but, but what, he did, what he does is this amazing exchange, just this righteous sacrifice of love that he does for you and for me. Because the truth is, God demands not one bit less of his, his righteousness, but the demand has been satisfied through Jesus, through Christ. And in verse 19, Paul says that is, and he drives it home even further. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Now, I want you to notice this phrase, not counting their trespasses against them. But why wouldn't he count our trespasses against us? Why not? We are the transgressors. We are the ones who estranged the relationship. We are the ones who committed the sin. God was perfect. There's no sin in him, but we made the mistake. Why would he not count our trespasses against us? Well, the answer is because he's counted your trespasses against 
him, Jesus. It's not that he's not counting them. He just ain't counting them against you. But he's counted them against his son, and his son paid the price, paid the penalty for us to be reconciled to him. And that's where we get this Greek understanding of the word exchange. This beautiful exchange has now taken place. It's incredible. It's amazing. So that's what we mean when we say, in Christ alone, my hope is found. In Christ alone. Because he has counted my trespass against his dearly beloved son. That he has taken my sin and put them to Christ's account. And he's taken his righteousness and put it to my account. The punishment that you and I deserve for all of our rebellion, Christ has now bore. And all of the forgiveness that I don't deserve, Christ has now provided. That is the beauty of the gospel. That is the exchange. That's why you are a new creation. And so early we saw the marks of those who are not reconciled to God. We saw that the nature of them is to be boastful about themselves, to commend themselves, to focus on the outward appearance and not on the heart. But now what Paul has done is he showed us the marks of those who are reconciled to Christ. And I want to give you three of them. For one, we have a different view of Jesus now. We don't relate to Jesus simply in the flesh like we might have done before. We're not just appealing to him like some cosmic Santa Claus to get us what we want when we want it. We're not appealing to him even in our previous nature because we might have invoked the name of God before, but there was an expletive behind it. But now we have a reverence and a respect for God because we understand his name and his nature and we understand the things of God and it's different for us now. So being reconciled to Christ means you're going to view Jesus differently. Secondly, secondly, it means you're going to have a different view of yourself. You're no longer going to regard yourself in the sum total of yourself based on what you can do or your outsides. You're not basing your importance and your worth on your intelligence or on your social status or on your money or on your abilities. And these things are not insignificant because God has given us all things richly to enjoy. But when we're in Christ, we now discover how to use those things for his glory and not for ours. It's for his name and not for our name. Now it's, it's different. Now we leverage those things for the kingdom of God. And thirdly, you're going to have a different view of others. You're not just going to look at somebody who's living reckless and just write them off and say, well, they're too far gone. There's just no help for them. This, we're not even going to try. No, now we look at people through the lens of the gospel. We look at the fact that their loss is based on the fact that they're alienated from Christ. And our compassion then kicks in. And we want to go share the gospel with them. It drives us to be evangelistic then, not just to be condemning. It changes our view of others. When we are reconciled to Christ, we see Jesus differently. You see yourself differently. And you're going to see your neighbor differently. As we conclude this this morning, um, I know that, that God is sovereign in, in absolutely everything, everything. And my intent was to preach through um, chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, but as I was digging into this and studying this and just praying through this, um, I'm going to go ahead and clue you in on next week. And, and by me doing that, I want to read for you the first part of, of verse 20. It says this. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now, ambassador is a political term. I'm going to read the definition for you. It is an accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country. So it is a political term. November 3rd is the official voting day. Many of you have voted early. I've done that myself. And I think you know this already, but this week is going to be a week of complete and total unrest in our country. No matter which way you chop it up, whoever sits in the White House at the end of this week, it is going to be unrest in our country. So I'm bringing up my sermon ahead of time for next week 
so you know where I'm headed. And what I'm preaching to you is simply what is already in the text. But the truth is, after this week, you're going to hear a whole lot of stuff. Because if Trump is elected, many will say there is a God. If Biden is elected, many will say there is a God. But Sunday morning, regardless of who is elected, I'm going to stand here and tell you there's always been a God. He's always been. Amen. There's always been a God, and his word is forever settled in the heavens. And so what we're going to talk about next week, according to the text that we're already in, is our role as kingdom citizens first. Kingdom citizens first. Our role as ambassadors for the kingdom of God. That's where we're headed next week. And we're going to stick to the scriptures. And we're going to exalt the name of Christ because he is exalted above all things. Nothing catches him off guard. Doesn't matter who sits in the White House at the end of this week. I was talking to a couple who left, and they said the test for uh, the test is really for the church after this and seeing what happens and what plays out. The test is for us to see how we're going to respond. That's true. Are we going to respond and be the people of God who love people that God has created? Are we going to continue to walk in love regardless of who sits in the White House? Because the truth is, God's sitting on his throne. <laughs> That's what matters most. So that's where we are headed this week. And we, we do that. We elevate Christ. Why? Because we have been reconciled through his son, Jesus. That is the reality that we sit in. And if you are in Christ, I want you to embrace the reality that you've been made new. I just want you to sit on that this week. Just embrace the reality that Christ has done something in you you could not do for yourself. We are still working through this process of sanctification together. We're not all the way where we need to be, but thank God we ain't where we used to be. We are walking through this thing together. But the truth is, if you're in Christ, you've been made new. You've been reconciled to the sovereign creator of the universe. Reconciled to him. It's absolutely amazing. And so I want you to hold on to that this week. And if you know Jesus by the Spirit, my encouragement for you today and this week is to walk in the Spirit. Live by the Spirit this week. Many of you are going to have some decisions this week, and and I'm talking about in any and every every area of your life. You got some tough decisions that you've already had to make. You got some that are ahead of you this week. You got to figure some things out. It might be family-related, might be job-related, might be financially related, might be health-related. I'm not sure. But my encouragement for you is when you get to that place, even before you get there, but if you find yourself in that place quickly, just stop for a second. Just pray. Consult the Holy Spirit and say, Father, I want to be led by you in this moment. I want to be led by you in the decisions that we're getting ready to make, whatever it is. I just want to be led by you. I want to have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to gird me up, to cover me in this decision that I'm walking in right here and right now. We hold on to that, the fact that we've been reconciled to Christ. Let that drive you this week. Let's pray together. God, we just thank you again for the word that is so true, that is eternal, that is rich, and that is real. God, may we take your word this morning and just really feast on it some more. God, I pray that your people would even take this text and just go back home and just read over it again, just marinate on it, put it into our hearts and our minds. Just let this truth really seek and soak into us. God, may the fact that we've been transformed and changed push us to an evangelistic heart just to, to, to share the gospel and pray that our brothers and sisters out in the world or in the workforce or in our circles, God, that they would be changed, that they would embrace this reconciliation that has happened because it doesn't just happen by association. It happens by heart transformation. It happens when we surrender to the almighty hand of you, God. So I pray that we would take it and we would run with it this week, God. Strengthen us so that we can be strong for you and preach your name to our last breath. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing together. Now let's sing this together. I search the world 
once was lost in darkest night yet thought i knew the way the sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave i had no hope that you would own a rebel to As I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed, you suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way. All I have is Christ. Lift your voices to the Lord. Sing that one more time. Hallelujah. high the name of Jesus in this place. We pray that as we leave, Father, that you would go before us, that you would make our path straight, that you would give us all wisdom through the power of your spirit, Father, and bring us together again. Let us be the hands and feet of Jesus and speak the truth of the gospel to those around us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.